Welcome to The Warehouse. Have you ever heard a sermon and thought, how in the world did he discover that? Or where did he get that idea? Every week at Cornerstone Church, two teams dig into the biblical text that will be taught during our weekend services. We spend hours talking about the text, the context, the culture of the time, you name it. But you can't stuff all that into a 30-minute message. That's where we come in. We're going to show you the stuff in the warehouse that didn't make it to the stage. Hey, Stephanie, what is your favorite book and or chapter in the Bible? (laughs) Okay, so before we started recording, you were asking me this same question. I'm like, I don't know. I don't think I could do this. Mm. But you still... But now you can? No. Yeah. You still still can't? No. I'm just going to say I really enjoy the book of Hebrews and for the fact of like that was the first book I ever really studied in scripture, Mm, which was a really hard one. Yeah. That's a hard one to study. But But it was a lot of fun. What were like some of the ahas in it for you? Do you remember any, like one or two? Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Okay. (laughs) So what was it about Melchizedek that excited you? It was just super exciting because I'm like, why is this guy even in here? Like, who is he and why is he so important that he would be in the, in this book? And so then I went down a spiral and started studying all of the things about him. Mm. And it was just super interesting. And I learned Mm -hmm. a lot. And then that grew my desire to learn more about the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good call. We hear about Joseph and we hear about Noah and we hear about all the the hall of faith. We don't often hear about Melchizedek on a Mm -hmm. week in and week out basis. Right. He just happened to make it in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was just super neat. And then so that's what started my whole like, I'm going to study all the time thing. Very cool. Yeah. Coincidentally, when I hypnotize people, that's, that's my word. Melchizedek. Yep. Melchizedek. And then they, they don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> Esther. <laughs> okay. You guys are so weird. <laughs> What's going on? This edition of How They Make the Sausage. Okay. Is oh, okay. No. Okay. Jay, yours? No, I'll go last. No, How about no. you? Oh. I love, <laughs> it's going to feel a little like on the nose because we're studying Philippians today. But like, as we were going through it, I was like, Philippians is one of my very favorite books. Yeah. It's one of those that like, as I look back through it, pretty much every chapter, there's something I'm like, oh, I wish we were talking about, we got to talk about that. Right. And I want to talk about that. Yeah. And specifically, if I had to pick out my very favorite chapter. It's chapter two. It's the it's the Christ poem. Yeah. And whenever yeah, you have the like, one. do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, yeah. but in humility consider others like as more valuable or important than yourself. Yeah. What a frame of reference for life, mm-hmm. right? If I just put everything through that filter, like, am I thinking of myself as most important right now or someone else? Yeah. And then the killer example after that of Jesus, who like laid aside the privileges of deity and took on limits. Um, yeah you know, emptying himself. It's sometimes called the kenosis passage, which actually I, I remember like getting super into that and then realizing that there was a heresy attached to that it, for people who, who thought that Jesus fully emptied himself of his deity and became mm-hmm. only a human. Right. So that goes too far. But when we talk about him laying aside privilege of deity um, and like, just as you read through it, it's just like the argument or the, the poetry of it is just really pretty impressive mm-hmm. where it goes that he, he gave this up. And not only that, but he became o- obedient to the Father. Not only d- obedient to Father, but to the point of death. Not only death, but death on a cross. And mm-hmm. that at the name of Jesus, you know, every knee would bow and yeah. every tongue confess. Man, that's Anyway, good. I love it. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Coincidentally, today we're in Philippians chapter 3. What's the, your favorite? The last half of verse 4 on to verse 14. Uh, and so coincidentally, my favorite book is Philippians, and my favorite chapter is Philippians chapter 3. We didn't talk about this. <laughs> okay. We didn't. Yeah, we didn't plan that at all. Um, and so I was hoping that hers would be Philippians 1 so we could just oh, come through. But it didn't, it didn't. Okay, I'm going to change mine. It's going to be Philippians 1. Hey! Yeah, yeah, because that's where he talks about to, to live, live. Christ and to die is gain. Yep. All right. There we go. Whoa. All three of us, same book. Yeah. What a happy coincidence. Philippians chapter just one, said his two, was three. Four, right? Yeah. And Parker's is the four. Man, see, <laughs> that's why the warehouse podcast is the place to be. There's some legit chemistry going on here, <laughs> even if it's forced. Philippians yeah. Hey. Is so, yeah. Really good Philippians, book, it was so I am old enough that I remember uh, having to subscribe to DVDs 
Mm. Like Columbia House was a thing. I owed them hundreds of dollars because I never stopped the thing. But <laughs> what? Uh, what? That is Columbia House. <laughs> holler at me, old people. Uh, no, what is this? Is it like Netflix? No, no. It's it's uh, like, you know how people can listen to music on Spotify? Mm-hmm. Well, back then to listen to your music, you'd have to have a, a round thing. Uh, it was a circle and right, we, we called it a CD. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got it. And we couldn't get them on the internets. We had to order them. And so you, Columbia house was this thing where you subscribed and you had to, you had to have them shipped to you, but it was a continuous subscription. You know how the, the wine of the month or the cheese of the month. Things. So is it only music? Columbia house was at the time. And then uh, they would send it and you would pay for it. Unless you said, no, I don't want anything this month. Ah. Yeah. It was a pretty good scheme. So, so why does this remind you of that? Uh, yeah, well, I haven't guessed. Well, also, also, I subscribed to Max Licato's teaching sermon CDs okay. from his church okay. in so Texas. So was that with Columbia House? No, it was, I'm just, <laughs> Columbia House as a frame of reference is the way we do this, the way it would happen. Nobody knows what it is. I, I a, uh, there are some geezers out here just I'm like tracking me with you. who know what it is. And uh, he preached on Philippians, and he talked about Paul's treatise on joy and mm. contentment, written from a prison cell. Mm-hmm. And he's like uh, that you're you're growing you're growing flowers while you're in the in the prison cell, you know. And and that struck me then. But even now, as I'm older, I grew up in church, and I was uh, just a self righteous Pharisee, and him especially here. And some of the stuff we're going to talk about today say, yeah, that's bunk. That's nonsense compared to knowing Jesus. That's really rung true for me over the last couple of years. Hmm. And so that's where we are today. Philippians 3, 4b to 14. Think I actually thought you were going to say, I actually thought you were going to say that, um, I thought you were going to quote a song. Do you remember, I grew up singing, uh, Knowing You, Jesus? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you get the lyrics out? Yeah. Oh, man, yeah. All I once held you, build my life upon. Anyway. Yeah. It's like just straight out of this chapter, and I love it, and I can't read this chapter without thinking about oh, the melody yeah. of it. Never heard it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, hey, we had different childhoods at different times. Mm-hmm. Nathan, Our was, childhood was about the same time. Yeah, yours was about the same time. Ours was about the same uh, form. Oh, interesting. Mm, Yeah, I like it. Okay. And ours. mm, (laughs) Nope. Very divergent. Mm, Well, our hair colors are similar. Hey, there you go. That works. Connection point. My big idea, I think, is what you're getting ready to ask. Yes. Christ is of infinite value. Oh, and then, I'm sorry, that was my first one. My second one, more tied to the topic at hand, was because our salvation is a gift, we work it out. Mm. Oh, that's right. That's when we started singing. Work it out from High School Musical too. Yeah, you can it. pause it and sing that song right now. I go for it. Hey, yeah. welcome back, guys. <laughs> Never heard that song before. Um, so my big idea was it is by faith. Everything else is poop. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> the laughter is simply because we said the word poop. <laughs> it's actually a very biblical idea that and, she just espoused. And we're going to get we there. did say poop. Yeah. 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 Morgan is the joy of knowing Jesus is better than anything we can do ourselves. I decided to throw Morgan's in this week instead of Parker's, but Parker's was still good. Nah. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I got the look from the producer. So maybe my part this week is going to be cut out entirely. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I had, so I I kind of built on a couple of the uh, Greek meanings of some of the words. So, I said, to seize the prize, we have to stop pursuing lies. But also later, I I just had the thought (sighs) that the Hebrew of Hebrews bent his knee to the king of kings. Not bad. Mm. Not bad. Not bad. That'll preach. All right. What do we know about Philippi, Stephanie? (laughs) You got some good context. Yeah. Sorry. I was like thinking and processing. You got it. Pull it together. Okay, okay, okay. (laughs) Maintain. Maintain. Okay, so this is about 30 years after Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus. 
Um, so this is after, like we've went through, um, a few weeks ago, second Corinthians 11, when he talks about all that he's gone through and his suffering, the five mm-hmm. lash, uh, five times of the 39 minus one lashes. So 40 minus one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I said 39 lash. Did you I say 39, 39 minus, minus one? one. My 30, bad. My yeah. bad. 39 minus one plus five. <laughs> Oh, okay. It'd be 40 minus two. <laughs> <laughs> Math. We just mathematated yeah. that. Just hey, stop. Math's okay. not our thing okay. here at the okay. warehouse. Okay. Anyways, so having that framework in mind of him like coming to write this letter and he's been through all of this. And so Philippians, as we've said, is like a really good letter. But for some, it can be called the resource through suffering. So whenever you're having like really hard times, like... This this letter is super good. Um, he it was written by Paul. Timothy probably helped write it. It was written around sixty one to sixty two A.D. Paul planted the church in Philippi around forty eight to fifty one A.D. First, and then this is the first city in present day Europe where Paul planted a church. How do we? Uh, do you have any idea like how they come up with it? They think Timothy helped write it. Mm, that's that's just read? I was just curious. Um, so what I was reading is just because Timothy like tend to always be with Paul and yeah. like he was like his father like figure mentor. Mm, yeah. So I'm wondering because I wonder that too. Just because he's, he's under house arrest right now, yeah. right? Most likely. So Epaphroditus is probably there. Yeah. Since, but he, he did have the gift, right? I do think it's interesting. So even when we talk about him being in prison while he wrote this and stuff, like. This was likely during his house arrest, in, during which he was like actually free to come and go um, more than what we think, and to mm-hmm. preach the gospel and have guests and stuff. So mm-hmm. anyway, it's That's kind of interesting. Good. Oh, so house arrest wasn't house arrest. Yeah, and, and he was at least allowed to have have guests. Yeah, they did. So not he have... could proclaim the gospel. I shouldn't have probably said that he could come and go. Otherwise, a, that's yeah. not really arrest. But like yeah. he could have guests come in. Anyway, it's just a little, That's little neat. bit interesting. I didn't know that. No electronic monitoring though. No ankle I don't bracelet. think so. No ankle bracelet. Okay. Just An- checking. Wait. We want to be historically accurate. Is it, what, is it called an anklet at that point? <laughs> I think sometimes it might still be called an anklet. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, the church in Philippi was a pretty healthy church, and it didn't need correction like Galatia and Corinth. Paul showed a lot of thankfulness and encouraged them to press on in their faith and to not get comfortable and slump back. Mm-hmm. You that said, was oh, Morgan's yeah. note. So yeah, I wrote a note. You said it can be called the resource through suffering. Right. Okay, go so, ahead. So it can be. I'm, so I, I kind of, I think I tripped over that yesterday too. So yeah. it it can be a resource for those of us who are going through suffering. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I just, I, I, for some reason, my brain, brain didn't want to compute that, that phrase. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm hmm. Yeah, because especially I think isn't it in Philippians four when he's talking about like he can be content mm-hmm. because he has had it all, and yeah. we'll be getting into that here too. But mm-hmm. Paul has definitely had a lot and has lost a lot, and yet he's still content because of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, there's a little bit of everything. There's something for everyone when you read Philippians. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, those of us who agree. are who are high, those are high on their what? own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, you know, if you're high, uh, read Philippians, I guess. Uh, high on ourselves is what I was trying to get to. So the, those of us who are self-centered, might have been a better way to say that. Parker, Maybe. cut yeah. that. Yeah. Leave it. Self-centered, those of us who are struggling, those are those of us who need to know how to, to treat others. Uh, there's just mm-hmm. something for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, so the city of Philippi itself is close to where the current city of Philippoi is in mm-hmm. Greece. But when I think of Greece, I think down in the Mediterranean where the islands are. I don't think the part of Greece that stretches up toward Eastern Europe. Uh, like Bulgaria. Yeah, right by Bulgaria. And you guys all know where Bulgaria is. We don't have to give you a geography lesson. I but... got to be honest. I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> uh, I... Would not have known that, except that you said Bulgaria yesterday. Yeah. I'm just pulling on your expertise. Yes, my expertise of Googling. Where was Philippi? <laughs> I've heard of Bulgaria. Yeah, that's back to where I think Christy wrote in and asked what our sources were, uh, what resources we used. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Google Maps a lot when we're talking about mm-hmm. Philippians. 
so yeah, so northwest there's an island called Thazos. So the city of Philippi was founded by Thasian colonists. So those from from Thasos in a uh, BC. So 360 BC, about a hundred years after Nehemiah was rebuilding Jerusalem, is when Philippi was founded. Mm-hmm. I thought I thought that'd be a neat. I love trying to figure out what was happening at the same time. Mm-hmm. Other things might have oops, other things might have happened, and this was this was one of those things. Um, yeah, so Ro- Romans conquered the area around 170 BC. There were gold mines nearby. Uh, the Romans used Philippi to control that part of the uh, Ignatian Way. It was a big highway through there during that time. And Paul, uh, more than likely, Paul traveled that road on his way from Philippi to Thessalonica on his journeys. I thought it's cool. So the World Heritage uh, UNESCO, uh, a United Nations organization, called this site a World Heritage Site because of its Roman architecture. Its lay- its urban layout is really similar to that of Rome, mm. which I thought was cool. And of course, its importance to early Christianity. This was the first church that Paul planted in Eastern Europe. Uh, and like you said, he was there right around 50 and 56, 61. And he wrote it from prison. Mm-hmm. And it's really like quite a positive letter as you read through it. It's not like occasioned by a bunch of errors that the church was making. So yeah, it's kind of cool. And too. if you haven't, I always like when we're talking about a different book to jump into what the Bible Project guys have on their yeah. little book introductions. It's also a very short book to read through. It's it's one that like you could sit down and read it in probably I mean fifteen minutes or something. Yeah, like it it would not take long at all. Hmm. What is that? Why it's my favorite book? It might be short attention span. Wow. Yeah. Not a lot of stick to itiveness. Anyway. Yeah. Whoa. I mean, so if you've been wanting something to read through, it's a, it's a good one. Yeah. That's I I tell a lot of people. Yeah. Dive into John and then mm-hmm. jump over to Philippians. All right. Anything else? Not for me. Well, then let's jump in. Philippians chapter three. We're going to go verse the second. So the second half of verse four to verse seven. Paul writing, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Mm, So good. Starting off with a bang. Yeah. What you got? So this was one, like I was looking into this a little bit, because what's what's happening here macro is that Paul is just laying out there all of the, like specifically like ethnic and religious heritage he has. Um, at which preps us for him be what he's going to say later. So he's just laying out there like, Hey, I've got all this like great pedigree. Yeah. Um, similar to whenever we covered his passage in second Corinthians. Yeah. Um, but there's some specifics here. So circumcision has to do with the physical, uh, manifestation of being a Jew. It's, it's one of the markings that they, you know, it was a, a sign of the covenant for them. Um, of the people of Israel, again, like I belongs to the Israelites, but then I thought it was interesting of the tribe of Benjamin, mm-hmm. you have that um, Benjamin was like the tribe that the first king of Israel came from. So Saul was mm-hmm. a Benjaminite. And then also that Benjamin was one of the, I saw two tribes. You mentioned three. You mentioned that the Levites also came back. I had seen that just Benjamin and Judah came back from exile. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was and some they, Levites. Yeah. Um, and there's mention of Levites, you know, after yeah. that and stuff. So it's not like all of them, but they also whatever. weren't necessarily considered a tribe. Oh yeah, for that that's part. Fair. So maybe that's that was the thinking. The... But anyway, so after the exile, like most of the tribes, like ten of them, didn't end up coming back and resettling. Yeah. Benjamin and Judah did. Um, so he's and so like some perception of that was that it was because they were more pure or more committed. So right. even with that, like it, he might not not just be throwing out a random fact about which tribe he was, but like, this is one of the good ones. Yeah. I, I can't remember the, the, so the, everyone was longing for the Messiah to come mm-hmm. uh, in Jesus day. Did they know that he was going to come from the tribe of Judah? They knew it'd be from David's lineage. Mm-hmm. 
which would have been from Judah. So yeah, yes. which would have been from da- uh, okay. Judah. Okay, that's I thought, but I didn't want to jump out jump out on a limb. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so Paul could have been even just tying that in that I'm mm-hmm. from the tribe that stuck with the one the Messiah was coming through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Benjamin being one of Jacob's two uh, favorite sons. Yeah, um, that Benjamin, Joseph, and Joseph. then Benjamin the youngest. Benjamin was the youngest. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I really liked this like first section because I'm swaying, so I'm sorry. Um, but where he's like laying out why he would have confidence in his flesh is because like these are things that he was pos- like he had position by birth himself. Mm-hmm. So the circumcision on the eighth day that was a like a, in Leviticus it needed to be done by the eighth day. A person of Israel or from the people of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews. Like, so he's laying it out there, but this was done by his birth. And then the second part is things that he chose. So as the law of Pharisee, to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as righteousness under the law, blameless. Like he's laying it out like, this is this is why I would have confidence mm-hmm. in the flesh. And yeah. so it was just, it was good. I like lists. And so I like making them mm-hmm. as like little bullet points. Yeah, very mm-hmm. cool. So uh, Genesis 17 and Leviticus 12 give some insight into circumcision and why that is such a, uh, an important thing. Uh, so describes why it would be important enough for Paul to mention it here and on the eighth day, uh, specifically as uh, in Leviticus 12, after giving birth, mom is unclean for seven days. And then on the eighth, the son is circumcised, which I thought was a fun which connection. Yeah, which is also really neat because um by the eighth day that's when the blood actually starts to clot within your system. So that's why a child can't be circumcised unless if nowadays you have to have a vitamin K shot. The babies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, very cool. Cuz they can bleed to death. Wow. So it's just neat whenever we see like God commanded that in scripture it had to be after the eight, like eighth day on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so took care of them physically. Yeah, took yeah. care of them physically. I just think it's neat. Wow, very really cool. Again, liberal arts major. I don't know nothing about no mm. blood. Uh, I thought the Hebrew of Hebrews thing, like I hadn't. I, so whenever whenever we see that phrase Hebrew of Hebrews, this was whenever they'd say like King of Kings yeah. or whenever you have Song of Songs, it's like it's the best of that category. So in the category of songs, this is the best song. In the category of kings, this is the best king. In the category of Hebrews, he's saying, I'm the best Hebrew. Mm. Um, and I also read that like there's potential that he was saying um, uh, that it, he also like spoke Aramaic. Mm-hmm. So versus like the Hellenized Jews, which would have spoke, uh, spoken Greek. Yeah. So he's so Hebrew that he even speaks the language Original, that yeah. their forefathers. Yep. That's spoke. really neat. Yeah. Man, yeah. Holy cow. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. So zeal there, we don't use zeal a lot, but zeal, one of the cool words associated with zeal was heat. Uh, And so you you think of somebody with zeal, there's a lot of heat uh, coming from what they're Mm -hmm. talking through. We had a fun discussion in Exegesis yesterday, and Nathan had some heat coming from him just a little bit. <laughs> got a little uh, fired up. Got a little yeah. fired up. Fired up. A little zealous. Quite hot. Uh, yeah. Heat. And so as to as to heat, let me tell you, I cared so much. I was so fervent. I was so zealous. I was a persecutor of the church. Mm-hmm. And, Which, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And so that, that word persecutor, it's a, a word we're going to see later. And it was kind of the basis of my big idea that that word persecutor, if it's just left on its own, it's a word to, meaning to per, to pursue. Uh, but when it's in the right context, it's persecute. Mm. Uh, so by implication, when you put it in the right place, it's persecuting uh, someone. And so here in this part, he pursued in a manner with his zeal mm-hmm. to kill the church, to arrest mm-hmm. Christians. Uh, he oversaw Stephen's mm-hmm. stoning. Uh, the first martyr, it happened with Saul watching on, who would mm-hmm. become Paul. Uh, so that was his misplaced pursuit led to persecution. Hmm. I had a note that said, this zealous Pharisee turned into a zealous missionary for Christ. The same Christ he had persecuted in Acts 9 became his savior. 
Yeah. I just thought that was super good. Like the flip. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very cool. And and we can we can give a, a preview when later on we're gonna talk about Paul pressing on toward Jesus. Mm-hmm. Pressing on, pre to press on. That's that same word. So it's it's not even that Paul uh, like his personality was different. It's just Jesus redeemed mm. those parts of him. Mm. So he's still the same guy who is passionate and zealous, but he changed his entire realm of what yeah. he's going to pursue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Man, I just, I, I just love that because it makes me think of, uh, there are some guys in college. For, uh, so from my high school, they were a year or two ahead of me. And they went down to Murray State and got involved in a campus ministry, and they developed accents and tones, their even their tone, uh, tonal patterns that that mimicked the guys in the campus ministry that they went to, and they started dressing like those dudes, and it was kind of scary for those of us who were outside that thing, and I just love this this picture that Jesus redeemed Paul to be Paul as a Jesus follower. Mm-hmm. And so the three of us are on the table, although mm-hmm. Stephanie gets onto us for having kind of a same wavelength about mm-hmm. stuff we talk about. We're different people and we have different interests and different passions and different skills and, and different gifts. Praise and, God. and so thankfully uh, God isn't calling Stephanie to be more like Jay. Mm-hmm. Thanks oh, be yeah. to God. Thank you. Um, and he's not calling us to be more like Parker. Um, which is, is okay, I guess. So if I could hit those high notes, it'd be all right. But yeah, he wants, he's calling us to be zealous about being us who follow him. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So another for under the law, blameless. So saying there, he like gave the right sacrifices. And so he was achieving the law's standards, not necessarily like he's basically saying like, hey, I was like perfect in these mm-hmm. ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. This is this is a fun little factoid. I don't know if you've thought about this, Ooh. but this is like a kind of one of those that I just grew up thinking. I don't know if any of you guys did. Um, and I caught it just because of a way that you said something a second ago, Jay, that um, Saul did not change to Paul. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a lot of like people in the Old Testament, like Abraham, that was, he started out as Abram and God gave him a new name and said mm-hmm. Abraham. Yeah. But actually Saul, Paul... Um, it was just Saul is his Hebrew name and Paul is his Greek Roman name. Mm-hmm. So like anyway, Simon Peter. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. right. Exactly. So they, when he's with the Hebrew audience, you'll actually see there's some places that he's still called Saul later on. And so I, I think it's kind of natural it for is, us to think that, that he encountered Jesus and Jesus gave him a new name, but that's yeah. actually not the case. Levi mm-hmm. Matthew. Right. Maybe. Was Matthew's name Levi? Yeah. Levi was Matthew. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, just a little factoid. Yeah, that's no, awesome. It's good. I like that. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Morgan talked about these in accounting terms. Mm-hmm. So when you're opening up the mm-hmm. books, you're mm-hmm. hoping you see things in the black. Uh, and he is, Paul is seeing his immense fortune now as just being all red, just mm-hmm. all loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the word gain there is plural in Greek. So namely saying gains as loss is singular. The various gains are all counted as one loss. Gains with a Z. (laughs) (laughs) All about those gains. Them Uh, gains. Yeah, so his his entire resume that he just said, I mean, he just spent a couple verses talking through why Hebrew folks would look up to him. And now he's saying it. Everything I had there. Not, and it's not just I had good stuff. I was the best. The best of the best. And mm-hmm. I count it as loss. And loss there. Loss there is damage. Detriment. It's, it's verse eight. Oh, no. Just kidding. Verse seven, you're still there. My Thank bad. you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, it's loss. It's it's detriment. That's so. It's, you know, it's not. This isn't a neutral thing that he's saying. Whatever gain I had, whatever great things I had, I now count them as detriment, as a as damage mm-hmm. here for the sake of Christ. Mm-hmm. And if I'm being honest, in my life, my resume has been a detriment to my for the sake of Christ. It's mm-hmm. been a detriment to how I I followed him. Yeah, I 
I almost think here though, like, isn't he? So, I mean, obviously he would say a persecutor of the church. Like that was not, that was not a good thing. <laughs> that was a, a bad thing. But at the time. But at the time right. he thought he was doing good. Right. So I do think like everyone around him would have looked and said like, be more like Saul. Yeah. Be more like Saul. Um, and there's, there's almost a, a feeling to me of like whenever Jesus says, hey, if any of you guys are going to follow me, you have to hate your mother and father. Um, mm. It's mm. kind of a, it seems almost like a matter of like um, relative valuation. Like what uh, do you see as m- yeah. more valuable? Yeah. He's so not ashamed like, that he was circumcised on the eighth day or. Right. Yeah. And there's some doors that have been opened and some authority with which he can preach because of his background. Mm-hmm. And so it's not like he's saying like, oh man, I wish I had, I wish I didn't have all that. Yeah. He's just saying compared to Christ, yeah. it's as if all this stuff was a negative. Yeah. He's not going to jettison that stuff because of the sake of Christ. Right. To use it because that's that, those are also things Jesus redeemed. Right. In the same way. So that's the, the likeness I'm seeing to the mother and father thing is like, no, there's a command in the Bible that we should honor our father and mother. Yeah. He's not saying literally hate your father and mother. He's saying in comparison to how much, how uh, loyal you are to me, how much you love me, it's going to make the love you have for your parents, like just so pale in comparison that it, you could almost say it looks like hate. Oh yeah. So I, yeah. I, I think the same thing's going on here. Wow. Something you love dearly, yeah. your, your mom, your dad. Yeah. And yet compared to how much we're to love Jesus, it seems like you hate your mom and dad. Yeah. Wow. And so that's kind of what I see, like, whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. It's like, mm. all that stuff was good, but it's nothing compared to Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Except the part about chasing and yeah. imprisoning Christians. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, and I'm just kind of like evaluating in my head right now whether that's really true. So, because um, the other thing you could do is say, at that point, he was doing it all from a position of morality. Um, and like trying to earn God's favor. So you could say along with Isaiah, like whenever Isaiah says that those things were our, our best righteousness is as filthy rags. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I could go either way with it. Maybe he is saying all that stuff because of my heart motivation, because it wasn't actually for out of loving obedience to God, um, that it actually was detrimental. Mm. I don't know. I guess I could go either way. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have thoughts? Yeah, I did. No, I was just thinking as you were talking. I was just, I'm just thinking, you know, present day of the successful um, CEO who has built his life upon his career, and he meets Jesus at age 53, and uh, and yeah, how Jesus isn't wouldn't necessarily wouldn't automatically be calling him to just turn around and walk away and and never set foot in the building again, but but that he would. Compared to how much Jesus means to him now, he would walk away from that mid six figure salary yeah. like that. Yeah. Anyway, that was a very specific example. Yeah. So yeah, if you <laughs> listen, fifty three years old, he's mid six figures. Yeah, we know there, who you are. <laughs> there are at least five stories to your building, so you're not okay. in Marion. All right. Um, Verse eight. What is she? She thinks she's the one that's keeping us going here i think she kind of is is she she might be (laughs) wow well all right indeed i count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing christ jesus my lord for his sake i have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish Mm. in order that i may gain christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Woo! Man, I I like Philippians 3. It's really good. Um, what so, about loss there in verse eight, Stephanie? <laughs> everything as a loss. Not only is he is he calling his religious pedigree as a loss, he is calling everything a loss. So, when in comparison to knowing who Christ is and who what mm-hmm. he has done, yeah, I just think that's simply amazing. I think everything today I've said today, I'm like, yeah, that's good. That's really good. <laughs> yeah, stuff. Like, such a good passage. Such, yeah. It's such a good passage. 
And I want yeah. I want to like like add to or like sharpen what you just said a little yeah. bit. Whenever you said like um, to know who Christ is and what He's done, it's like yes, and it's specifically to know Christ. Yeah. Mm. So not even like facts about Christ. Right. It's a and, relationship too. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like I don't know, and that's something that like has just been sitting on on my heart yeah. since we started studying this it, is like. I want to know Christ. Yeah. I want to, and like that is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. It's yeah. to be found in Christ, having His righteousness, having a relationship with Him, friendship with Him. I want to. I want to know Christ. Yeah. Michael mentioned in the meeting today. So this is, um, yeah, doing the meeting. math. Uh, so this would be a week ago now. We can have, wow. so we can have a go ish wow. because we we've had a couple switch flippity flops on sermon release dates. And so about a week and a half ago, uh, uh, Michael referenced something uh, from over the weekend and he mentioned a quote or or something a guy named Jack Deere said that every day Jack Deere wakes up and asks God to help him feel his affection. Mm -hmm. Wake up and help me feel how much you love me today. Help me feel how much affection you have for me today. And man, that really, really hits at home. Uh, Knowing Christ, uh, it just really hits because later on, uh, the next section, we'll talk about how Jesus has made me his own. Uh, And I mean, how mind boggling it's going to be. But I don't think we do a great job of, of remembering every day just how much passion Jesus has for us. Oh, yeah, no. Mm hmm. No. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Goodness. And I just think of like, so often, like, I think our thought process is like, um, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of going to heaven or the surpa- Ooh, surpassing yeah. worth of like the riches that are stored up there for me or um, the blessings that I'm going to receive here in this life. And just to see that like, In under house arrest, having lost everything, having experienced all those lashes and stuff, he's like, Yeah, it's been so worth it because Mm -hmm. I know Christ. Mm Yeah. Yeah. And in an intimate way. Yeah. Not just like a I know who he is because I read a story about him. Or because he appeared on the road to Damascus or whatever. It's like it's not just that he's operating off of this ancient, like, okay, I believed in Jesus back there and he called me to ministry. And so then on the other side of this, I'll get to go be with him. But he's like, it's uh, he's saying from a position of authority, it is so worth it because mm. I, the, there's surpassing worth in knowing yeah. Christ. Yeah. yeah, he didn't say the surpassing worth of how I met Christ Jesus, my Lord, because mm-hmm. nobody's met him like that, mm-hmm. bef- you know, before or since. Uh, but the the surpassing worth of knowing mm-hmm. Christ Jesus, my Lord, mm-hmm. present tense. Wow, yeah. wow, wow. Yeah. And so, yeah. So he mentions loss twice in verse eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, he counts everything as loss. So those things that he sees as gains mm-hmm. before, those things that can still be gains that we talked about, he counts those as loss. Mm-hmm. But now he has suffered the loss mm-hmm. of all things. Mm-hmm. So he has given up the resume that he's that he used to lean on. He's not leaning on his resume anymore. But now uh, he has been fired uh, from the job he used yeah. the resume for. Right. He's lost yeah. the house. He's mm-hmm. he's lost the car. He's lost uh, the second house in Florida. The camel. Did he I vacation in? Okay. It's possible he was one of the most widely traveled men. Right. The... It's a long road. Ancient world. So. It was a big highway. Yeah. Florida so he is likely. actively lost. We counted, uh, we, we went through the, the ways he experienced loss couple mm-hmm. weeks ago. Yeah. And go back and, and read that list from... Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. 11. Was it 11? I think. I don't remember which chapter. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, that that was not one of our favorite chapters. <laughs> and so he counts them all as... Poop. Poo-poo. Doo-doo. Scubula. Scubula. <laughs> I think that's the Greek word, right? <laughs> Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> S K Y is how we say it. yes. Skibala. 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 Yeah. But I like scubala. Are you guys being serious or joking? I don't know what's it's, going on. It's the Greek word. Yeah. Oh, Skibala. it really is the Greek word. Yeah. Okay, well. That means rubbish or excrement or dung or feces. Mm-hmm. Or scraps or thrown. Or table scraps. To dogs. Because, again, 
It's another Hapax Legomenon. Do, 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 do. Hapax <laughs> Legomenon. Again, do, 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 do. you guys know we love a good Hapax Legomenon. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, another one of those words that is experienced only once in the New Testament. And so nice. that's kind of the reason why there is a wide variety of what in the world we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, it's... It's where my big idea came yeah, from. Yeah, mm-hmm. because in most cases, we think it's doo-doo. Yep. Uh, we're just going to sit in that for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let that soak in, just I like, guess. Okay. <laughs> That's a long pause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Verse nine. Uh, doo-doo. So you verse... have nothing else about doo doo there. I... We had a ten minute conversation about doo doo. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about the like worthlessness apart from Christ, and how our life is means nothing, like apart from Him. Yeah, you talked about what it meant in other literature in the time, since it only appeared once in the I Bible. Yeah, we we talked about it quite a bit. Yeah. What else so did I say? in in other in other literature at the time, this word, uh, so it can mean refuse, the dregs. It can mean dung. Um, yeah, it, it can also mean what's thrown to the dogs. Yeah, yeah. So which I thought was cool because that was in the very beginning of the chapter. It talks about dogs, right? And dogs that here are not like your cute little pet that you had. Yeah, dogs were gr- like coyotes. Yeah, like mm. coyotes. Yeah. Yeah, it's in 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 other literature, it was used as a normal, polite word to refer to a variety of types of waste. So, some people have thought over the years that Paul was cussing, can right, can, uh, comparing it mm-hmm. uh, in that way. Parker, and so, I need you to bleep this out. He was saying it. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was all get, get your finger ready on the bleep button. Uh, but yeah, so not so not doo doo in a in a naughty way, mm-hmm. but a polite way to say it. Uh, it says it was even used in medical and religious texts with no sign that it was offensive. Uh, s- s- scubalos. The masculine form, that's where I think we got it. The masculine form of the word has even been used as proper names in at least a dozen men that they found in, in records. Can you imagine? Being, oh, man. I mean, uh, Benjamin, his mom named him oh, Son of Suffering. But his, so right. Benjamin wasn't his name, but his dad changed his name. Wow. So that he wouldn't live with a name like Doodoo. <laughs> what? And so Scubulos, there were at least a dozen men that's been found in ancient like, texts. Hold on, like Benjamin, like from I'm just we're tri- just saying so he was the tribe of Benjamin and Benjamin Jacob's son, uh-huh. his his original name wasn't Benjamin. His mom named him before she died something else. Okay. And Jacob changed his name. Okay. Then. I was but, trying to track with you, but you were losing me and I bet everybody else is lost, so I tracked us back. No, it's fine. You're back. We're back. Everybody's back with you. If you were lost, email us. <laughs> Warehouse no. at cornerstone.team. I hope people Scubalos. send in say like, Jay, we were totally lost. No, 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 mm-hmm. no, 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 no. How did you get there? I've got a tracker. Okay, tracking. so verse 9. Uh, verse 9 speaks of justification. Ju- verse 10 speaks of sanctification. And verse 11 speaks of glorification. And why do you say that? So this, <laughs> uh, he's being the listener here. Okay. Why do you say that, Stephanie? Yeah. So sanctification means we, or sorry, justification. Christ died for our sins, and we are now considered justified in front of God. Yeah. Well, so it's like a, okay. in a legal sense, right? Yeah, so illegal. it's a one time mm-hmm. we are no longer sinners, but made righteous. Yeah. Yep. So okay. justified being the legal term. That we're not guilty. Right. Sanctification. And so you're saying, so you're saying that justification is verse nine. Mm -hmm. Why do you say that? (laughs) (laughs) Reread it. Why? We talked about this. On this audible podcast, (laughs) he asked the question and she pointed to the screen. (laughs) Because my brain is not working and you guys normally okay. throw in and help me and I'm like my brain it's oh, not here I just, <laughs> I'm happy to help do you want some help, yeah, help. <laughs> no I'm sorry I'm so sorry my oh. brain is not working oh yeah so be so that would be because he says not that I'm found in Christ not having a righteousness of my own so that would right. be like that 
a righteousness of his own, he stood condemned that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. So that his righteousness, his righteousness comes through faith in Christ and it's the righteousness of God that depends on faith. So he's saying that like, I wasn't righteous. Now I am. Yeah. And that's like a, a once legal declaration that happens. Thank you, Nathan. Carry on. Now, do you want to talk about what sanctification here in verse 10? I can, if you'd like. Go ahead. Uh, my brain. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to so I'm so verse ten. I'm yeah, tracking with you a little 10. bit I mean, that I may uh, know him and the power of his resurrection. I, I would say like the, the present, becoming like him. Yeah. Oh, I don't suffering. know that I even agree with that. Yeah, we disagreed a little bit. We pushed back some. Yeah. So hmm. the, because the becoming like him in his death, um, I have I don't know. I, I guess we have a little bit of like the the dying to self there represented, mm-hmm. right? So that's so sanctification is our ongoing process of being made more and more like Christ, right? The up and to the right, more yeah. and more, more and more like Christ, uh, which we'll never complete here. But like, whenever we get to go home to be with Jesus, that's when it will be perfected, and we no longer have Preach. this wretched man that we carry around yes. mm-hmm. of our flesh. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, anyway, so I, I guess we were talking about. That being represented in verse 10 because of the power of his resurrection is like that power of newness of life. Whenever we read through, I think Romans uh, 6, the first part of that is a great example there Mm -hmm. because you have some, um, you have some like uh, language about baptism and specifically that we died with Christ and that we've been raised to newness of life Mm -hmm. with him and which, you know, living that out is our sanctification. Mm. Yeah. And then glorification being the resurrection of the dead that's represented there in mm-hmm. verse 11. So that's what will happen at the end of time, whenever we get to, when our, our bodies are raised. Mm. Yeah. So then we got to have a good discussion yesterday that I'm not going to talk about. I'll let you guys, because my brain's not working, <laughs> but we talked about by any means possible. So this wasn't him saying like, ah, I don't know if I'll be able to make it. This mm. was him saying, uh, nope. Like, holy cow. No, I don't. Well, because at the time they didn't know if resurrection, like what that looked like. It wasn't him necessarily saying, like, I don't know if I'm going to make the mark. It was him saying, like, we don't. Yeah, he's not he's not talking. He's not writing with doubt in his mind. He's not saying that hopefully if I work hard enough, I mean, hopefully who knows? I'll get the resurrection. I'll flip a coin. There's a good chance I'm going to make it. Yeah, he's not saying that at all. Yeah. Uh, so some some people have said that that word by any means uh, is 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 uh, hitting an exclamation point and not a question mark. Mm-hmm. So how man and how yeah. right, that he's uh, that I'll attain resurrection of the dead. You know. Yes. And Amen. how holy cow it's gonna happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Another way that we talked about it was a little bit of like that it's not it might not be that he's um, concerned about like whether he's going to achieve the resurrection, but the mechanism of yeah. resurrection is still right. like totally a mystery. Yeah. Like exactly what does it look like mm-hmm. when, like if my body decomposes in the ground, uh, in what way am I going to be raised? Right. Yeah. In what way is it going to be glorified? And like, do the individual particles come out? And it's like, <laughs> sorry, I just had this weird moment where I'm like, you know, people die and decompose and then they turn into, uh, they turn into soil that then nurtures plants that then we like we eat. So do particles from my body go back to their original owner because I have like, and you know, vice versa. Like, yeah. Pieces. Whoa. Of, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. You're right. And yeah. I really like that conversation that Paul has no idea how it's going to happen, mm-hmm. but he has full confidence that, that it it's going to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and then it made me also think of yesterday, first Thessalonians four thirteen, where, um, In that, like, they weren't quite concerned. Like, there's the soul sleep that some people will grab from 1 Thessalonians 4.13, where he is saying, like, uh, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. It, we are talking about, like, Paul did believe in, I can't, my brain. Jesus. Jesus, he (laughs) He did. did. He did believe in Jesus. Fact. He did. (laughs) <laughs> he didn't look at me like that. He, he believed in Jesus. It's possible. <laughs> An actual resurrection of the yes, body. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's it's like a 
So you introduced the term soul sleep. If you're not familiar with that, it's a, it's an idea that like, what happens after we die? Like, do we go immediately to be with God, mm-hmm, but right. our bodies stay in the ground yeah. mm-hmm. here? So how does that work? Does our consciousness, yeah. mm-hmm. um, does our consciousness go to sleep until the end of time, whenever it's united with our body and then caught up? And then it's one of those that's like, um, I do not personally think that. And I think there's good reason to think yeah. that it's not. And specifically, I would I would go toward um, Jesus with a thief on the cross yeah. saying, today, today yeah. you're going to be with me in paradise. Yeah. Um, and Paul saying, like, to be absent from the body mm-hmm. is to be present with the Lord. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, like, to me, there seems to be an immediacy, not like an yeah. intermediate state. Um, and so then, like, my understanding uh, would be our souls go immediately to be there, yeah. but then all of our bodies are resurrected at the same time whenever Jesus returns. And that's mm-hmm. whenever we get our glorified bodies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that's the way I make sense of it. Yeah. Thanks for describing yeah, that. Sense. You're welcome. It, but those those that would ascribe to it, I think, would say... But it will seem like that because if you go, if you take a nap, it doesn't seem like to you yeah. that any time has passed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I agree. I'm with you. But again, yeah. by any means, that's we'll right. have the resurrection of the uh, dead. It's yeah. like, I don't know how it's going to happen. And it, man, it's a, that's a good opportunity to, to remind us that, that these things that don't affect the bedrock mm-hmm. messages of the faith, that we can hold them with open, open hands yeah. and not hold on for, for dear life mm-hmm. against things. Um, because yeah, Paul didn't know how it was going to work. Yeah. We don't know how it's going to work. Yeah. We just know it's going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. We mentioned resurrection a couple of times. I love that the, the Greek meaning of resurrection is, uh, one of the ways to look at it is as a standing up again. Oh, I love the picture of that. Resurrection so is a standing up again. So is surrection to stand up? Surrection must be to stand up. And so a resurrection means to stand up Hang on. I'm having some epiphanies here. An insurrection would be... To stand up against? To stand up against authorities. Whoa. A surrection might just be to stand up. And then resurrection is to stand up again. (laughs) Yeah. Resurrection. To stand up again. How great is that? An antisurrection would be to lay down. Yeah. (laughs) Antisurrection is to to lay down. Uh, Oh, I had a bad dream. Just antisurrection, darling. (laughs) Antisurrection. Man. It's so this good. This works. It's it it's everything. And I'm picturing uh man, for as much as I can't rewatch uh Mel Gibson's movie uh Passion of the Christ, that last scene where the resurrection happens, and it just makes me think they laid him in a tomb and yet on the resurrection there was a standing up again and he came out. Mm. Ooh. Mm. Anything else for that section? Well, how about we finish with verses 12 through 14? That's a great place to finish. Thanks, man. Because it's the end of the passage. It is the end of the passage. And we did promise them to verse 14. Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies Mm -hmm. ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again. Woo! Again. Philippians 3, folks. Yeah. Read it. Um, (laughs) Read it and weep. And again, but here, so I press on to make it my own. Paul was zealous. Yeah. If you read Acts and you see how he stood up and preached to every group of people that he that is recorded there, and it didn't matter where he was and it didn't matter what they were doing, he got up and with zeal he proclaimed the resurrection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was someone who was zealous and he was heated. And here it's the same word. Before he used that zeal to persecute, and now he uses the zeal to mm-hmm. press on, mm-hmm. to pursue Jesus, and then to help others for the rest of his days. He's helping others, trying to raise them up to pursue Jesus as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's good. So it, I have like, you know, a little bit of a question whether verse 10 was like fully about sanctification, but it's definitely what this verse is about. Mm-hmm. This, what do we do in the in the middle, in between whenever we came to know Christ and we're justified in him and we go home to be with him uh, for glorification. What do we do? We press on to make it our own mm-hmm. because yeah. Christ has made us his own. Mm-hmm. Ooh, yeah. And so it's like, we so often get those two flipped. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's like such, it's the, 
it's a works based salvation. It's an uh, and it like totally will jack up our idea of salvation if we say um, I press on so that Jesus will make me His own. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But instead, it's like the the order is Jesus makes me His own. He has bought me with a price. I am found in Christ, united and in, in Him, uh, united with Him in His death and His resurrection. And so, because of that. I press on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, make it my own here, verse 12. So I press on to make it my own because dry, Christ Jesus has made me his own. Mm. Make it my own. Make me his own. Different, uh, different. Um, Tense. Yeah, different parts of the same word. Mm. The same words, you know, Greek has crazy different ways mm-hmm. to uh, for their meanings, but different uh, yeah. ways to say the same word, to seize to take eagerly, to possess. Uh, Christ Jesus has seized us. Mm-hmm. And I press on. I spend the rest of my life seizing him, mm-hmm. trying to seize him more. I also had a note that said um, some false teachers in Philippi had adopted a perfectionist view of spirituality. Paul says that even though he has counted everything as lost for the sake of Christ, that doesn't mean he has arrived and he he is not perfect. Mm. Yeah, I don't I don't consider that I have seized it yet. Right. I have not made it my own. Right. Yeah, all this I've been working at this since I've I met you guys 11 to 14 years ago and in that time I've been still walking across the earth planting churches, writing letters. And yet, uh, yeah. Yeah, Paul, not me and you guys. I met you guys. <laughs> Stephanie was three super years confused. Ago. Like, She's like, we've only known each yeah. other for three years. Yeah. I also did not know that you walked across the earth and planted churches. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Wrote letters. I haven't walked across the yard to plant a church. <laughs> yeah. Or a tree. Paul or a tree. Paul <laughs> speaking that I have I don't consider that I've made it my own yet. I haven't yeah. seized him yet. I haven't I I'm not sanctified. I am trying to seize it. I'm going to press on and spend the rest of my life trying to seize Jesus better. Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. Mm-hmm. We we were talking some, and I think Parker brought this up. I know Parker brought this up. Like we see a couple really big differences between like verses uh, four through seven and then 12 through 14 mm-hmm. in Paul's attitude. And like, as he's describing the transformation that's happened to him, which I think is just really cool. So up top, you have him talking about a righteousness that is through the law. Whereas down here, he clearly is banking all of his righteousness on the identity and work of Christ. Like the fact that he is in Christ. So his like metric for evaluating his salvation is totally different. It used yeah. to be, I've worked so hard. And mm-hmm. so I, yes. I am a great person and mm-hmm. God owes me. Mm-hmm. And now it's, um, man, only because of Christ, mm-hmm. oh, all that stuff is worthless, and Christ is the 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 um the surpassing worth. And then the other thing is, along with that, is an attitude up top. He's like, "Yep, I was uh, blameless or flawless according to the law." Mm. This idea that, like, "Yep, I I was nailing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had arrived yeah. uh, in the in the way of practicing morality." Um, and down here he says, not that I have obtained this or I'm already perfect. And how mm. neat is that? It's like, we know that up top, actually, he was not right with God. Right. Yeah. But according to the law, I mean, he was great. Yeah. And down here, we know that he is right with Jesus, but he also recognizes humbly that he's not arrived. Right. Mm. So I just I just love that. Yeah. Have you ever heard Alistair Begg preach? Scottish preacher. Probably That's so funny. Presbyterian. I had a conversation this past Sunday about Alistair Begg. Did you really? Yeah. And somebody was talking with me, uh, Nick Martin was telling me how much he loves um, Alistair Begg's voice. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Kind of deep, gravelly Scottish. I can't. I I was going to, (laughs) and I cannot, but I so wish I could. But he, he tells a story about justification and he talks about how if, if you're talking about your own justification in the first person, you're doing it wrong. Mm. Huh. Uh, that if you start the sentence with, I believed and I trusted and I did this, that you're, you're doing it wrong. Because when we talk about it, we should be talking about it in the third person. He saved me. He rescued me. And then he went on to talk about it uh, in response to the thief on the cross that well, this guy 
he gets he gets to the pearly gates and the angel comes out and he says the angel asks him hey what are you doing here and the guy says i don't know and he says well what do you mean you don't know hey, well all right let's go through do you know anything about justification i don't know anything uh yeah do you know anything about grace and how, how often did you study scripture he's like i don't know what you're talking about and the guy the angel says uh all right i'll go get my manager and uh the supervisor angel comes out and asks him why in the world do you think you belong here and he's the thief on the cross says yeah i don't know the guy in the middle cross told me i could come Mm. Uh, and he tells it in a much better way than I do. Mm-hmm. But but that is yeah. the story. The guy in the middle cross said I could come. Mm. I think I've heard I think I've heard um Brad McGinty share that story ah. as well. So the, both of those being yeah. some of our elders and mm-hmm. these are just solid guys. Yeah, yeah. that's I'll, I'm gonna make man that in a middle said I could the come. one that you sent. Because uh. you sent it, didn't you? I think. Yeah. So it'll be I on our resources. Mm-hmm. Oh sweet. That's cool. Yeah. It's cool. And his voice. Then people can hear his voice. That's yeah. the main reason that people want to watch it yeah. now. And so later on, Parker will put in an imitation of a Scottish voice right here. <laughs> that would be fun. Mm. Thanks, man. Parker, can you try? No, no. He, he put. He's already put it in. <laughs> no, but I'm saying like right now, him just come over and do it. No, no, no. no he'll put it in. It oh. was. In, it was in. We appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, guys? Oh, the goal. The goal. You remember when we talked through the Revelation series and how uh, the, they talked about the trophy and the crown uh, and the goal. It's kind of the same: a, a prize, an award, a prize in the public games. So we press on toward the goal for the prize, and in that, it's the upward call, the heavenly invitation. Mm-hmm. Call there is another way you could, or another way you could say it is invitation. Yeah. His heavenly invitation. He's pressing on. Yeah, the Greek word for goal can mean either a finish line in a race or an archery target. The prize for Christians is the blessings and rewards in the age to come. And whenever I hear those, like the the end of the finish line and stuff like that, I can't help but think of Hebrews. Mm. Hebrews, I think, is it Hebrews 12? So surrounded by such a great cloud of mm-hmm. witnesses. Yeah. To finish yeah. the race well. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then... Also, I kind of wanted, yesterday you were talking about the glorification and um, how just constantly, because I asked a question about, so when we get to our glorified state, like we're still going to be learning more about Christ. Mm. Like this is not a thing like, hey, we get to heaven and we get in our glorified body and then boom, we've hit it, right? Mm. We're constantly always going to be in intimate relationship with Jesus. And so you painted yeah. it really, really well um, with mm. the marriage and so... I kind of wanted to hand that back to you because it was just good. I was just thinking about like, so heaven is not going to be just a same continuation of what we're doing here. And and that's kind of what what it was. It's like, I I felt like there was a little bit of like, hey, you know, we're going to just keep, we're just going to keep, you know, doing what we're doing here and gradually learning more about him. And I was thinking about like, whenever we, you know, whenever we think about heaven, we, one of the first things that happens um, is the the wedding supper or the marriage supper of the lamb, whenever Christ and his bride are united at last, Mm, his bride that he came to purchase, um, to pay the price for. And so, um, it's like, I, so I talked about it, like being with a, with a, a marriage that you have the engagement phase where like I was in, while I was engaged to Tia, we were still continuing to learn about each other Mm. and get, get to know each other. Um, but then it was, you know, a very different uh, kind of getting to know each other, you know, when we were married. And that's like in in all the way, like physically and emotionally and intellectually and stuff. And so I still continue to get to know her more yeah. and more. Like I didn't become disinterested or like, it's not that I know everything about her, but also I know her in a, in a way now that like I was not um, in, you know, in our engagement. Mm. And so I just think of like, there is a certain element of now we long for so we we can know Christ right now mm-hmm. and then there will also be a difference in heaven because now we see as in a mirror dimly but then we will know fully even as we are fully known it's like mm-hmm. he knows us fully mm-hmm. but we're still looking through a mirror because of our mm-hmm. our flesh and yeah. stuff 
Yeah. Anyway, so it just like makes me yearn for that day that like I know Jesus now, but I will really know him there and mm. I will continue getting to know him even more there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Know. So it's like an intimate way of knowing him, not just a knowledge way mm-hmm. of knowing him. Right. It's a relationship. It's something that we continue to do mm-hmm. and we will continue to do. Oh man, I guess going back to like that uh, quote Michael was talking about, uh, there will come a day when we won't have to ask God to help us feel mm. his affection for us anymore. Yeah that we'll be living in it, mm-hmm. that, that that will be our air. That'll be That's our good. reality. Man. Anything else, guys? Not for me. So what else are you excited to hear this week? I was going to take us all the way back to verse 10 really fast. Nice. <laughs> that, that might be a I record. can't do it one time. I have to just do it. So just the sharing and his suffering, it's not like saying that you go out and you look for pain to be done mm-hmm. to you. But this part was like Acts 5, 41, when they left rejoicing and counted it worthy to suffer in mm-hmm. his name. Yeah, Peter and John went in front of the Sanhedrin mm-hmm. and uh, they said, hey, just stop preaching about this guy. And Peter and John are like, sorry, I, <laughs> you do what you got to do, but we can't stop talking about this guy who used to be dead. Now he's alive. Yeah. We can't do it. And so they were beaten mercilessly and then left like skipping, uh, yeah. rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Yeah. So which allows us to know Jesus even more deeply on a level that we didn't even understand that we could. So thinking mm-hmm. as I've like grown in my faith and just being thankful for the things that I've had to suffer through because mm-hmm. it's caused me to have a more intimate relationship with him because I've had to depend on him more than ever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Jesus is going to use that to reach people that Nathan and I just aren't mm-hmm. going to be able to relate to because mm-hmm. we just didn't have that experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man. Okay. Now you can end it. Sorry. I think. No, no worries. So as far you? as like excited, yeah. I, my, mine's on two levels. One would be like union with Christ is mm-hmm. like one of the absolute essential doctrines of the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's so important. And so just to be diving into like, what's it mean to be united with Christ, mm. I think is exciting. I don't know how, like how much Michael's going to go there, but yeah. anyway, I'm excited even just get to scratch the surface a little bit. Mm. Um, and then I'm really interested to see, um, you know, this text was, was picked to um, be an anchor for the question of like, am I a puppet with God pulling the strings? Mm-hmm. And I'm really interested to see like the ties that are made there. I can see some of it, Um, I wasn't in communicators meeting today, so I don't know how exactly he made the leap, but, um, (laughs) anyway, I shouldn't say leap. I think it's, I think it's a a good connection. And specifically, I think we see in that, um, Christ Jesus made me his own. So I press on to make it my own. That's where I see like the real tie of, yeah, Jesus has done the work. So Mm -hmm. now we do the work. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, and, and that's to, to, I guess. Give it up a little bit. That's that's where he lands. That okay. God does the work, and we have to do the work. Yeah, yeah. and and living in that apparent paradox mm-hmm. of what does that even mean? Yeah. Uh, that, so but that's where we live. That God did the work, and we have to do the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm excited uh, about the opportunity for those in the room like me who grew up and built their spiritual resumes and learned to burn it. And to put it through the shredder, mm. uh, to give up our list of rules, to give up that tendency we have when we l- rely on our list of rules to persecute others because their their lists haven't lived up to my lists, and uh, to to release our arguments about things that don't matter as much as Jesus does, and then to pursue mm-hmm. Jesus mm-hmm. like we pursued being right, mm-hmm. uh, to chase after Jesus to to know him and make him known like we wanted to be known as being the one who was right. Uh, man, I'm excited for, for us to celebrate that Jesus has made us his own. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think my excitement piece would be the freedom that some people could have in knowing that Christ desires an intimate personal relationship with him, mm-hmm. not just a surface level, know all of my Bible, know, like know my word, front and back, but to truly know who he is in a relationship aspect and not just a checklist. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Anything else, guys? No. Well, all right, guys. Uh, 
man, until next time, the warehouse is closed. Catchphrase. I think it's great. Say bye, baloney man knows. That, but that was the, until next time, the warehouse is closed. Yeah. And then hard stop. Because that's the catchphrase. Can you say bye now? That, that's our bye from now on. Until next time, the warehouse is closed. <laughs> <laughs>